After the mighty Xiongnu Empire in Mongolia had splintered into many pieces, nomadic tribes that once belonged to this state wandered westwards from the 1st to the 4th century. Among them were several groups that founded kingdoms historians used to call Hunnic. But while the Alcons ruled over Bactria and the Hephthalites even invaded India, there was one definitive group called Huns that crossed the Volga River in 395 CE and would invade large parts of Eastern and Central Europe shortly thereafter. Feared by their contemporary neighbors, the Huns were described as unhuman people, bloodthirsty and with no honor. But in reality, the Hunnic tribes were as pragmatic as the Romans of that time, perhaps even more so including Germanic tribes into their state. The core Turkic tribe soon established an empire which would rule from Denmark to Bulgaria and from Ukraine to the Netherlands, with Hungary becoming their main region of settlement. The Huns, who unlike their neighboring tribes were unique migrants from Central Asia, carried elements of their original culture to Europe, including the religion of Tengrism, as well as ancient shamanistic traditions, a Turkic language, and a writing system that might be the precursor to Gokturk runic script. Attila's Huns famously waged war against the declining Western Roman Empire, climaxing in 452 with the destruction of Milan in northern Italy. However, Attila's mysterious death led to the Hunnic Empire's disintegration into several independent states over subsequent decades. There are many books and documentaries about the Huns available, but almost all of them have been written and made from a Western perspective, a perspective that sees the Huns as an invading threat, as barbarians with no culture, as an enemy from the East. Instead of taking that biased route, we will now show the other side of the coin and explain who the Huns really were from their own perspective. Using recent academic studies, archaeological evidence and common sense, we will reconstruct the history of the Huns from the ground up, offering a story that has been either kept secret or ignored for centuries. This is the rise and fall of Attila and the Hunnic Empire. Hey, Turk! Üstte mavi gök basmasa, altta yağız yer delinmese, senin elini, senin töreni kim bozabilir? Artık titre ve kendine dön. The climax of the Xiongnu Empire, under the decisive rule of Modu Chanyu, also known as Mete Han, was marked by an unprecedented consolidation of power and territorial expansion. Mete had orchestrated a significant reorganization of the Xiongnu Tribal Confederation, resulting in the establishment of the first nomadic empire in Central Asia. He successfully challenged the Han Dynasty creating a nomadic military machine that extended its influence from Manchuria to the Caspian Sea. For the first time, virtually all the tribes and neighboring peoples of the eastern Eurasian steppe belt were united, both voluntarily and by force. However, internal discord, external military pressure, and climatic challenges hastened the decline of the Xiongnu long after Meite's reign. The Han Chinese, a persistent enemy, capitalized on these weaknesses, gradually regaining their lost territories and putting a severe strain on the Xiongnu's resources. This external pressure, combined with internal political disputes, led to the split of the Xiongnu into the northern and southern Xiongnu, a split that hastened the disintegration of the empire by the first century AD. Following the demise of the Xiongnu empire, a power vacuum was formed on the steppes. This provided geopolitical opportunities for a number of Turkic and Mongolic tribes to rise and migrate across the expanse that was once dominated by the Xiongnu. Several states that either beard the name Huna as self-designations emerged in Central Asia, among them the kingdoms of the Alkan Huns, the Chionites and the Kidarites. They were later followed by the empire of the Hephthalites, also known as the White Huns. The designation white might be related to the association of the West with the color white in Turkic cosmology, as well as the fact that the empire had been created by Hunnic elites. 
In both Turkic and Mongolic societies, the political elites were associated with white, while the common folk was called kara, as in black or dark. Thus, during the era of the Gökturks, the kara bodun of the Turkic societies translates to the land of the people. In any case, before we continue with the Huns in Europe, let us quickly go through the most relevant Hunnic states. The Kidarites were a nomadic confederation that emerged in the 4th century, following the dissolution of the Kushan Empire in Central Asia. These Huns originated from the Altai Mountains and established a significant presence in the regions of Bactria and Gandhara, where they left a notable artistic legacy, particularly in the form of coinage and Buddhist sculpture. Despite their military prowess, the Kidarites were unable to maintain a stable empire. By 370, remnants of the Kidarite state were overrun by Alkhan Huns coming in, who thereby initiated a domino effect that led to their control over vast territories stretching from Central Asia to the Indian subcontinent. Their aggressive incursions significantly weakened Gupta Empire in India, triggering socio-political shifts that impacted the subsequent development of the region. The Alcon Huns' interactions with different cultural groups precipitated a syncretism that is evident in the religious and societal norms of these regions. One of their most successful rulers was Toramana, who managed to invade Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan and Kashmir as part of the then Indian world. The Ristal inscription explains that the Alikara's people had defeated him and shortly thereafter the Alcon rule collapsed. It is interesting to note that Toramana bears a striking resemblance to the old Turkic name, which means as much as righteous, remember that Tura was the law and customs of the ancient Turks. Whether that really makes Toramana a Turkic ruler, however, is open for debate. As the origins of both the Alcon Huns and the next polity are difficult to decipher. Central Asia was ruled for the last time by a Hunnic people known as the Hephthalites. Their self-designation seems to have been a Bodolo, actually. Ruling from Kucha in the Tarim Basin in the east to Afghanistan in Iran in the west, the White Huns performed many battles against the Ruran in east and the Sassanids in West Asia. The empire's founder was Kingila, who had united the Chayanites and Uars, even more Hunnic people, after they had fled from the Wusun further east. The Wusun, in turn, were displaced due to attacks by the rising Roran state. Perhaps that explains the relations between the new Hephthalite Empire and the Ruran Kaganat. The Hephthalite rule had reached its climax when suddenly their fate took a dark turn. In 552, the Ruran nobility was overthrown by the Ashina clan who created the Gokturk Kaganat. The viceroy responsible for Western affairs was Istemi brother of Ashina leader, Bumin Kagan. Rapidly, Istemi's forces approached the west. Unlike the Xiongnu some 500 years prior, the Gokturks attacked southern Central Asia. In or around 560, the White Huns were crushed during the Battle of Bukhara by a joint gokturk sasanian army. Istemi had allied himself with Khosrow, the Iranian king of kings, just shortly before the invasion took place. Remnants of the Huns stayed in Bactria, however, and were henceforth vassals of the Gokturk Kaganat, often aiding the Turks during their battles against the Sassanids. It is unknown when the Huns vanished as a cultural entity, as their population was multicultural anyway. But traces of Hunnic nobility presence can be found even after the fall of the Gokturk and Sasanian empires. Further, it is believed that the Hephthalites left an indelible mark on the ethnogenesis, the Pashtuns, the Kalaks and Kalaj in Afghanistan, and the Ainu in East Turkestan, Xinjiang. Around 370, during the era of major Inner Asian migrations, a distinctive group departed the Altai Transbaikal region in Eastern Central Asia, heading west. Their exact composition remains uncertain, but it's believed they were the nomadic warriors who would go on to form the Hunnic Empire. Their specific migration route is ambiguous, but it can be inferred from the following map. 
suggesting they traversed the Eurasian steppe belt as nomads typically did. Factors possibly prompting this migration include climate shifts, demographic issues, and political disturbances. On their way, they encountered the Alans, Iranic nomadic pastoralists who lived between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. The Huns, demonstrating military superiority, overwhelmed the Alans, who were partly absorbed and partly fled further west themselves. Advancing to Eastern Europe around 375 CE, the Huns engaged the Ostrogoths near the Black Sea. Following a decisive victory, the invaders subjugated the Ostrogoths. These events marked the first milestone in the Hunnic advancement. Facing the Huns' military force, the Visigoths, a prominent Gothic tribe who had settled in Romania and Ukraine at that time, migrated south into the Eastern Roman Empire, sparking the second phase of the so-called barbarian invasions. As up to 50,000 Goths reached the Balkans, leading to the Great Gothic War against both Roman factions, the Huns' power in Eastern Europe grew. After subduing the Alans and driving out the Goths, the Huns established a realm in Central Europe's Hungarian plains, marking the emergence of a tangible Hunnic state. This was their second milestone. As the Huns exerted their influence and expanded their territories, they moved from being solely a nomadic war machine to an established, although not quite sedentary, political entity. What made the Huns special then, in comparison to all other barbarian peoples that were wandering across virtually all of Europe? Firstly, the core tribe of the Huns, the original Huns, were migrants from Central Asia. Ethnically, the core was of Turkic descent and formed the basis for later Uyghuric Turkic peoples, including the Bulgars. That seems very certain with regards to recent academic research. But similar to the Xiongnu Empire in Asia, the Huns in Europe integrated non-Asian and non-Turkic peoples into their realm, often as subjects but also as allies. Thus, secondly, they took a political approach akin to the Roman Empire's. Rather than annihilating conquered tribes or driving them out completely, they sought tribute and acknowledgement of Hunnic dominance. In exchange, these tribes could join the Turkic Huns in warfare against other groups, receiving a portion of the spoils. This method proved effective as the predominantly Germanic tribes under Hunnic control became their allies. Consequently, during the Hunnic-Roman conflicts, Germanic individuals fought on both sides, sometimes from split factions of the same tribe, confronting their own relatives. In 395 CE, the Hunnic forces launched their first major offensive against the Eastern Roman Empire, seizing Armenia and devastating Cappadocia, even pushing into Syria and nearing Antioch. Simultaneously, the Huns began a siege of the Sassanid Empire. This attack was initially successful, approaching the empire's capital at Ctesiphon. But the subsequent Persian counter-offensive led to a severe defeat for the Huns, a fragment from that time period that was made public in 2021 might give some insight into Hunnic culture. According to Genghis Saltaioglu, illegal excavations carried out during the Syrian civil war between 2013 and 2015 unearthed stone fragments, which also included runes that should seem familiar to many of our viewers. This resembles the Orkhon script that was later used by the Gokturks and other Turkic peoples from the 6th century on wards. The text is in remembrance of Upper Kurgic, a Hunnic general who had invaded the Caucasus in 395 and 396. It reads, his faithful companions leave Kurgic to peaceful rest. Since the Huns had indeed reached Syria, the text could be authentic. In that case, it would serve as evidence for the use of a script that is identical to the Orkhon script, long before the Gokturks adopted it. The raiding Hunnic groups left the area by 398. However, not due to counter-offensives by the Eastern Roman consul Eutropius, but on their own accord. A question many viewers might be asking at this moment is, of course, 
why the Huns attacked those areas in the first place. It appears evident that their primary objective was not to establish dominion or permanence within the territories they assailed, but to engage in predatory expeditions, looting provinces of their resources, including livestock. Priscus of Panium is one of our main sources for Hunnic history, and indeed the history of Turkic tribes that emerged after the Huns. Providing an account in a later era, he cites anecdotal evidence from the Huns present at Attila's encampment that attributed the initiation of the many raids to a famine across the Ponto-Caspian steppes. This circumstance may also have served as the impetus for incursions into Thrace. Otto Menchen Helfen, a German scholar and central figure in Hunnic research, postulated that Bazik and Kurjik, the Hun chieftains implicated in the invasion of Persia, could have arrived in Rome by 407, serving as mercenaries and not as invaders. This claim is supported by Priscus's narrative, in which they traveled to Rome with the intention of forming an alliance. The Huns' first significant diplomatic interaction with the Roman Empire occurred under King Rugula. The Eastern Roman Emperor, Theodosius II, agreed to pay an annual tribute, basically to keep the Huns beyond the Roman Empire's borders, thus recognizing their growing power. The Huns, while maintaining nomadic lifestyles and retaining their prowess in war, began developing a sophisticated political structure, leveraging diplomacy alongside military might. Because in reality, the Huns were not ruled by one, but by two kings. While Rugula was responsible for the eastern part of the Hunnic realm, thus coming into contact with the Eastern Romans, his brother Oktar ruled the western lands, including modern-day Hungary. Rugila's name could be the Germanized version of a Turkic name, while Oktar, originally Oktem, meaning strong and proud, is clearly the Latinized version of a Turkic or Mongolic name. Both the Hunnic kings and their forerunners entrusted the army's power to its generals, often former tribal chieftains. These generals led raids on nearby settlements, with local rulers paying gold for mercy. If agreed upon, the Huns would accept the payment and depart. An account by Ambrosius, the late 4th century Bishop of Milan, notes that the Huns overtook groups like the Alans, Goths, and Sarmatians sequentially. Despite the lure of foreign gold, the Hunnic army during the late 4th century maintained discipline, attacking settlements even after taking bribes. This discipline, signifying strong control by the generals, was pivotal to the Huns' success in subsequent years. Contrary to common perceptions, the Huns had a multifaceted relationship with Rome, acting as both foes and allies. The imperial courts of Milan, later Ravenna, and Constantinople aimed to strengthen ties with the Huns to deter attacks. After Oktar's death led to a significant Hun defeat by the Burgundians, King Rugula frequently allied with Rome and received compensation for action against Germanic tribes as the Romans sought stability to reduce Hunnish threats. Such payments from settled states were crucial for the survival of nomadic equestrian groups like the Huns, who, even at their peak, seemed to lack a lasting material foundation and relied on the distribution of spoils due to their decentralized governance. Just four years after Oktar's death, his successor, Rugula, also died leaving the leadership to Oktar's younger brother, Munjuk's sons, Bleda and Attila. They jointly ruled the Hunnic Empire and quickly brokered a peace treaty with the Eastern Roman Empire, raising the annual tribute and thus the income of the Huns. Concurrently, Europe saw rapid geopolitical shifts and migrations. The Roman Empire had split in 395, the same year the Huns crossed the Danube. Prompted by Hunnic invasions, Various tribes like the Vandals, Suebi, Alans, and Burgundians entered Gaul. The Vandals then moved to Roman Africa, and the Sasanian Persian Empire seized the opportunity to attack Armenia, an Eastern Roman vassal state. 
The Huns had indirectly pushed Germanic and other tribes into Roman lands. However, the Romans and Huns still had an ambivalent relationship, with Romans employing Huns as mercenaries for quite a while. This Roman-Hunnic cooperation, if we can say so, spanned from 401 to 450, aiding Roman military successes. Farther to the north, Attila and Bleda were very successful in their campaigns both in Hungary and the Balkan, conquering Belgrade among other settlements in the process. When the Eastern Roman Empire response did with a large-scale counter-attack, Roman soldiers witnessed that the Huns were now using battering rams and other siege weapons by which they annexed the cities of Nish, Sophia and Lulaburgas went as far as defeating a Roman army near Gallipoli. The Roman Emperor Theodosius, unable to defend his realm militarily, admitted defeat and sent Anatolius, the Magister Militum, to discuss peace terms. The new terms were very demanding. The Romans made a one-time payment of 2,000 kilogram of gold for violating the prior treaty during the invasion. The annual tribute to the Huns increased threefold to 700 kilogram in gold, and the price for each Roman prisoner in Hunnic hands was substantially raised too. After securing their demands, the Hun leaders retreated deeper into their territory. It is there where the fate of the Huns would be decided. Until this point in time, Attila and Bleda had co-ruled and coexisted peacefully as kings. But it seems that one had bigger ambitions than the other. Ancient sources tell us of an event during which Bleda tried to lure Attila into a trap while inviting him to hunt a boar. Attila was then surrounded by Bleda's troops but managed to persuade them into joining his cause instead. Bleda's forces switched sides and aided Attila in killing his brother. Whether Bleda was really killed by his own kin or not is open for debate, though the actions of the ambitious Attila should not come as a surprise in any case. Bleda's name, by the way, seems to have inspired the name of Buda, a settlement which was later merged with others to form the city of Budapest. Buda is the Hungarian name of Bleda. More about these Hunnic influences later. Instead of sharing the throne with another relative or someone from the Hunnic high nobility, Attila claimed power for himself. For the first time ever, the Huns were ruled by a single king. Now, nothing stood in Attila's way. Unlike the kings before him, Attila wanted more than power among his own kin. His goals were the conquest and domination of the surrounding tribes. He would go on to become the most famous and feared Hun of all time. As the Hunnic Empire steadily gained influence in Europe, a confrontation with Rome became inevitable. For nearly a millennium, the Roman Empire expanded from a city-state to dominate parts of Europe, the Middle East and North Africa. As it transitioned from republic to empire, Rome faced challenges from migrating Celtic and Germanic tribes, especially after the Huns' invasion around 395, which intensified these migrations and pressured Roman borders. Despite the threats, Rome often enlisted these tribes as mercenaries, offering them land within the empire. The Huns, initially in peaceful contact with Rome, eventually became a significant security threat. There's evidence suggesting early contact between the Turkic and Germanic worlds, highlighted by both groups' use of runic script which was also adopted by Vikings and Gokturks. There are further similarities in the respective mythologies of the Central Asian and Norse peoples. The Norse Yggdrasil, a vast world tree connecting realms like Asgard and Niflheim, is akin to the Turkic tree of life, Ulukayin, connecting various levels with deities such as Tengri on the seventh stage above and Erlik in the underworld beneath. Symbols from Central and Northern Europe also show resemblances to Turkic symbols. While not definitive proof, these similarities suggest potential cultural connections between ancient Germanic, Nordic, Turkic, possibly Finnic, and Magyar peoples. Such shared traditions might have fostered better relations between the Turkic and Germanic tribes within the Hunnic Empire. 
Attila's assault in the west was unexpected since he and Aetius had been allies. The reasoning of the Hunnic campaign in 451 CE, as presented by the Goth Jordanes, has been questioned due to potential bias. He claimed that Geyseric, king of the Vandals and Alans, initiated the campaign to avoid retaliation from Theodoric, the Visigoth king, for mistreating Theodoric's daughter. Jordanes alleges Geyseric bribed Attila to attack Toulouse, the Visigoth's capital. However, this claim appears unlikely given the maritime dynamics of the Vandals and Visigoths. Furthermore, Jordanes later contradicts himself by saying Attila had planned the campaign independently. Another dubious fragment, this time from the rather reliable Priscus, claims that Attila attacked the Western Romans to win Honoria and her fortune and to assist Geyseric against the Goths. Gossip from Constantinople hints that Honoria, sister of the inept Roman Emperor Valentinian III, secretly offered herself to Attila to escape a marriage her brother arranged. Attila then demanded half of the Western Roman Empire as dowry, which was declined. The story suggests Attila invaded territories for Honoria, even though she was in Italy, and to aid Geyseric. Hyun Jin Kim, expert in Hunnic history, argues that while this story would make for compelling drama, the idea of Attila starting a large-scale military campaign in the West due to a damsel in distress appears illogical. Kim asserts that Attila's campaign was driven by geopolitical factors. By 445 CE, Aetius, with Hunnic support, had established control over Gaul and began meddling in the affairs of the Franks in the Rhine area. Both Aetius and Attila saw the Franks as within their spheres of influence. Priscus indicates that they supported different contenders for the Frankish crown, likely Salian, leading to tension between Aetius and the Huns. Attila aimed to bolster Hunnic influence among the Franks, which the Romans interpreted as him wanting to take over half of the Western Roman Empire. Attila's assertive remarks heightened concerns. Sources, including John Malalas and the Paschal Chronicle, cite a Hunnic messenger proclaiming Attila's supremacy over both Roman emperors. Did Attila seriously consider himself to be above all? However, after relinquishing most Balkan territories by 447, Attila didn't seem intent on a lasting occupation of Italy. A potential Hunnic invasion of Gaul, possibly underscored by Aetius to secure allies, led the Visigoths to side with the Romans over fears of being next on the Huns' list of potential targets. This culminated in a pivotal battle between the Huns and Romans in northeastern France on the Catalaunian plains in 451 CE. Aetius, despite his Visigoth alliance, pulled back deeper into Gaul, wary of the Huns' might. The situation escalated in Orléans when the Alans, crucial to Roman strength in Gaul, vigorously opposed a Hunnic siege. Attila's focus on the Alans hints that his main aim was not the Visigoths, but Aetius and his Alanic support. As the siege prolonged, Attila surprisingly withdrew, perhaps due to the campaign season ending, and retreated to Hungary. This move spurred Aetius, the Visigoths, and the tenacious Alans to chase the Huns, meeting them at Chalons, the Catalonian Plains. The Battle of the Catalonian Plains, while deemed pivotal, wasn't the war's apex. Historically portrayed as a shield for Western Christendom against Asiatic impact, this view mainly emerged in the 19th century, lasting until the mid-20th century. Modern perspectives see the battle as challenging the Huns' perceived invulnerability, with sources like the Cambridge Illustrated History of Warfare highlighting it as a showcase of Roman defensive strategies. The dominant narrative suggests a Roman or Gothic triumph over the Huns, rooted in fears of a catastrophic Hunnic takeover of Europe. However, as Kim highlights, much of Europe had already been under Hunnic influence for about 75 years, spare the coastal regions to the north. While Hunnic rule brought challenges, it wasn't entirely detrimental in Germanic Europe. In the Battle of Chalons, both sides had similar military components. Both had Inner Asian cavalry, Alans for the Romans, Huns Alans for the Huns. Aetius, 
might have had Huns from past alliances, seen as traitors by Attila, while Attila had Eastern Germanic groups. Both sides also utilized Western Germanic tribes and had a Gallo-Roman presence. Essentially, the battle's result wouldn't have significantly changed Europe's post-Roman direction as both factions epitomized key European elements. Appearance-wise, based on Jordanes, Attila might have had a Central Asian look, but most of his troops were European. Ultimately, the Battle of Chalons wasn't about race or religion. Both sides had Christians and so-called pagans. The Huns, influenced by Tengrism's syncretism, displayed greater religious tolerance than the Romans, though. And the battle's actual importance is in the near collapse of the Western Roman military, leading it to become fragmented mercenary bands under barbarian leaders later on, detached from Roman authority. And interestingly, during the battle, both Thoris Mud, the Gothic leader, and Aetius lost contact with their forces and found themselves amidst the Huns. Despite Jordanes depicting a Roman Gothic victory, this situation suggests it was more likely the Allies were the ones being pursued. This claim is further supported by the fact that after the battle, it was the Roman camp which came under siege, not the Hunnic one. Post-battle actions also suggest a less definitive outcome. The Visigoths retreated to Toulouse and Aetius sent away his Frankish allies. Lastly, the discovery of a Hunnic cauldron near Chalons hints at the Huns retaining control of the battlefield post-battle. The battle was, nonetheless, massive, with perhaps up to 300,000 people taking part. But the outcome is unclear. We would suggest a strategic victory on the Romans' part, as several sources indicate that the Huns had not been actually defeated. For example, the Gallic Chronicle of 511 doesn't state a clear Roman victory at all. Attila's choice to return to his Danubian base led some, like the Gallic chroniclers, to perceive a Roman Pyrrhic victory. Prosper of Aquitaine even suggests that the Huns, having seemingly lost their appetite for battle, decided to return home, leading to a Roman claim of victory. Thus, the Romans perceived a victory not due to a clear triumph on the battlefield, but because the Hunnic forces chose not to advance further into Gaul, perhaps due to the massive losses. Lest we forget, the Huns in Gaul did not actually take part in battle as they usually did, as horse archers, but had left many of their horses behind to fight as infantry in the forested regions. Would it have made a difference had the Romans attacked a Hunnic force somewhere in Hungary, perhaps? Either way, the Huns were far from finished. To the contrary, just one year later, Attila moved into Italy, this time with the actual claim to marry Honoria and thus inherit the Roman Empire. He devastated many villages in his path. As a consequence of his invasions, inhabitants sought refuge on the islands of the Venetian lagoon, marking the nascent stages of what would later become Venice. Aquileia, in particular, suffered such devastation that pinpointing its historical location became challenging. While Aetius lacked the military might to confront Attila directly, he strategically hindered Attila's progress. Upon reaching the River Po, logistical challenges, potentially inclusive of disease and supply shortages within Attila's camp, might have been instrumental in curtailing his invasion ambitions. In response, Valentinian III dispatched distinguished representatives, among them the Bishop of Rome, Pope Leo I. They successfully brokered a Hunnic commitment to retract from Italy and engage in peace negotiations with the Roman Empire. Prosper of Aquitaine attributes the successful dialogue to Leo and argues that the decision by Attila might have been influenced by fears rooted in superstition drawing parallels to Alaric's fate after he had sacked Rome in 410. Once again, the actual facts paint a different image. Italy, at that time grappling with a severe famine, continued to experience agricultural setbacks in 452. The scorched earth tactics employed by Attila exacerbated these conditions. 
The logistics of advancing on Rome, given the food shortages in Italy, posed a significant challenge. Capturing Rome wouldn't have resolved Attila's supply dilemma, making it strategically prudent to formalize a truce and retreat. Additionally, external pressures emerged when an East Roman contingent, led by another officer who was by chance also called Aetius, crossed the Danube. This force confronted and defeated the Huns, left to guard their native lands, while Attila was in Italy still. Consequently, Attila faced a confluence of strategic, logistical, and external military pressures, compelling his withdrawal. This was certainly a strategic victory for the Romans, and not after direct confrontation against Attila. As Emperor Theodosius was succeeded by the ambitious Marcianus, who stopped paying tribute to the Huns altogether, Attila prepared the invasion of Constantinople. But in 453, he suddenly died. Historical sources try to explain his sudden demise by pointing at Ildico, the woman that Attila had married a day before. Jordanes tells us that Attila had organized a large feast at home in Hungary to celebrate their marriage. Ildico, said to have been beautiful, was probably of Germanic or Gothic descent. Then again, Attila did survive two assassination attempts by Onegesius and his brother Scotus just a few years prior. He certainly had many enemies. Whatever the case, the king left an empire that wasn't ready for a successor yet, because his sons, Elak, Dengizich, and Ernak, struggled with their ambition to lead, leading to the empire's fragmentation. These heirs sought to divide the nations among themselves and treat the subjected peoples like inheritable assets. This approach led to unrest, and a Germanic alliance with significant figures like the Gepid ruler Arderic, who had once been loyal to Attila, rose in rebellion. This culminated in the Battle of Nadau, where Elak, Attila's eldest, was killed. The son's attempts to reassert control over previously subdued territories, like the Goths, failed. They faced resistance from leaders like the Ostrogothic co-ruler Valamir. Various factions of Huns moved across regions following these failures. Dengizich made a significant effort to invade across the Danube in 468 AD, but faced defeat and was killed the following year, marking the end of Hunnic dominance. While many of Attila's offspring and relatives are historically recognized, tracing a verifiable genealogical line from them has proven challenging. Several claims have been made, like that from the Nominalia of the Bulgarian Khans or the Hungarian Arpad dynasty. Several medieval Hungarian chronicles also allege that the Arpad dynasty and the Abba clan are Attila's direct descendants. This leads us to the discussion about the legacy of Attila and that of the Huns in general. For centuries, nay millennia, Attila has been depicted as a ravishing, destructive tyrant who was killing for mere satisfaction or to possess fame. But there is also a narrative that paints Attila as someone sent by God to punish Christians and the sedentary peoples in general, regardless of religion, as the scourge of God. A narrative also used to explain the sudden rise and success of the Mongols some 800 years later. At the end of the day, the reasoning lies precisely in the search for answers. How a seemingly uncivilized people could suddenly appear, seemingly from no man's land in Central Asia, and cause so much destruction could not be explained by the Huns' contemporaries. Regardless, the Huns did leave behind an important legacy. Firstly, their attacks on Europe led to the migration of Germanic tribes even further than before. This led directly to the victorious rule of the Visigoths in Spain and Gallia, the Vandals' conquest of North Africa, and ultimately to the fall of Rome. Because what Attila could not accomplish in 452, a certain Odoaca, who had served as general under Attila and came from the Turkilingi tribe, became king of Italy sometime later in 476. The pressure by the northern barbarians had become so great that the Romans could not withstand their attacks forever. Thus, indirectly, the Huns did cause the fall of Rome eventually. Even more importantly for the history of the steppe people, 
the Huns laid the foundation for stronger presence along the western Eurasian frontiers. As the Hunnic Empire disintegrated, several tribes became independent and stayed in Eastern Europe. Among them were the Bulgars, the Utigurs, and Kutrigurs, who became part of the Turkic-speaking Onogur Federation. And at the same time as the Huns laid siege to Roman cities, another semi-nomadic tribe, also speaking Turkic and praying to Tengri, was beginning to rise in the Altai region further east, the Gokturks. <laughs>